Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. So pest management is one of the biggest challenges in gardens, and I mean all gardens. In today's video, I'm going to talk about the ways in which people who grow food for a living handle pests organically. So whether you are just a home gardener, a market gardener, or somewhere in between, there will be proven tips throughout to help. Also at the end, I'll go through a couple different crops and what pest management looks like on our farm. So let's do it. First, plants are no dummies. Plants developed mechanisms over the course of millions of years uh, to defend themselves from pests without having to really go anywhere. That would be phytochemicals released from their leaves that make them unpalatable to certain pests, or perhaps they have learned to cultivate relationships with macro or microorganisms um, who help protect them. Often, it's all of the above and more. Before we go to the specific pest management stuff, though, there are a couple critical things we have to discuss. But first, a quick word from today's video sponsor, Seed Time. Tired of complex garden and farm planning spreadsheets? Seed Time makes it a breeze to easily visualize when to seed, transplant, and harvest all year round. You'll get a personal crop calendar, automated weekly task list, journal, and more to save you a ton of time and headaches planning your garden or farm. Get your free Seed Time account with $5 worth of free seeds, sweet, at seedtime.us slash no-till. Don't forget to slash no-till it. That's the thing people say. Okay, so what we have to understand as growers is that our first line of defense against pests is not protecting or spraying plants with something. Uh, rather, our job is making sure that plants have the tools that they need to protect themselves. What are those tools? Well, without making this an entire dissertation on soil health, because someone thinks that would be a boring eight hour long video, I disagree with the boring part. Providing the tools to the plants really boils down to a few simple things, many of which we've discussed here on the channel, but in a nutshell looks like this. Number one, the soil needs to be adequately moist. Plants use water in both photosynthesis and the transportation of nutrients slash microbes. Uh, microbes utilize water to create the antibiotics or antifungals or other secondary metabolites that help protect the plants. Water is the beer of the soil and is essential for life. I'm pretty sure the science bears that one out. Number two, compaction in the soil needs to be addressed. Slowly, over time, plant roots and microbes and worms will break up your compaction, yes. But if your soil is extremely compacted around the root zone, so four to eight inches down, you are going to lose a lot of plants in that time to pests and diseases. Compaction limits root and water penetration, laying the groundwork for pathogenic organisms to go absolutely bonkers, but also limiting the plant's ability to thrive. A broad fork coupled with consistent production and or cover cropping is a minimally invasive option for addressing compaction or on a larger scale, you can use a subsoiler. Do this for a few years and you should no longer have to crack into the soil, ditto for the plants. The number three thing is just providing adequate fertility to the soil in the form of compost and or other organic amendments so that the plants have the nutrients that they need to build the compounds that they need to fight the pests that they really, really don't need. Number four is paying close attention to soil temperature before planting. Planting into too warm of soil or too cool of soil can slow the plants down and potentially render them susceptible to pests. Number five is hardening plants off, especially those started in cell trays, which tend to be more sensitive to transplant shock than soil blocks in my experience. Essentially place the tray in direct sunlight while keeping them well watered for roughly a week before planting, if at all possible. Uh, but those pillars are just the beginning the starting point of pest management. For more on soil management, consider picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook from notillgrowers.com for a more detailed soil breakdown and to support our work at the same time. Thanks. Now, if you do all of the above, well, you will simply see fewer pests in general, but healthy soil alone is not always going to solve all of your problems. I know that's a common assumption or refrain, but I don't know of any market gardener who doesn't at least have the occasional pest issue. So the number one thing professional growers do that others might not is simply address pests preemptively. What I mean is that people who do this professionally do not just assume the soil is going to take care of the issue or that the issue is just not going to happen. One big way that manifests itself is through insect netting. Many, if not most pests, do not just bubble up from the soil below your plants. Some do, but they often just fly in or march in or just come in from the outside. The cabbage worm, for instance, comes from the cabbage moth laying eggs on brassicas. Uh, protect the brassicas from the moth and there will be no eggs underneath of the leaves. Cucumber beetles, 
though slightly more clever than the cabbage moth, uh, also have a hard time getting to cucurbits that are protected. Flea beetles, who love to absolutely demolish tender leaves of brassicas, and nightshades, among others, really struggle to get underneath and thrive when insect nettings are applied. Now, I discuss row covers and insect nettings in this video, but we use ProtectNet that we buy from Johnny's Selected Seeds. Most other row covers, even the white ones, are way too thick and thus too warm for summer and can suffocate your plants and are too light and will rip to shreds in a matter of weeks, which is no fun. It's not a great use of money. Uh, ProtectNet, albeit expensive, is well made and lasts a long time. I'll link the insect netting in the show notes. One important note here though is that if it's a flowering plant you're covering, such as eggplant or cucumbers or whatever, you will need to remove the insect netting in many cases to allow for pollination. At that point, hopefully the soil health is enough to take you the rest of the way, but I will also discuss a few sprays as well here in a bit. Um, another preemptive thing some farmers do, one I don't necessarily recommend, but we'll get to that, is release or apply beneficials. Um, so an example of this is that growers will buy in ladybugs or lace wings, among other predators that they can release into their high tunnels to devour aphids and other pests. Now, this is a bit complicated and a bit controversial of a practice. Complicated because buying in beneficials is expensive expensive and oftentimes needs to be done several times over the course of several months. It's a controversial practice because although importing uh, these beneficials can be effective at managing aphids, harvesting of ladybugs, to use that example, can strip them from their native habitat, such as the Sierra Nevada mountains in California where they converge in mass, thus the Latin name Hippodamia convergens. Uh, also, importing them can potentially bring in diseases and parasites to your own native populations, or the ladybugs can just fly off. If you've never seen $100 just fly away, that's one really great way to do it. So for me, I say rather than relying on importing pest predators for aphid control, ideally you are, or at least you're simultaneously planting a lot of flowers that will attract a variety of predator species, not just ladybugs and lacewings who beyond pests also feed on nectar and pollen but many other good guys as well, including wasps and spiders and all the things. The sweet alyssum flower, for instance, attracts two different types of parasitic wasps that lay eggs in various herbivorous worms, ultimately leading to their death. And of course, flowers bring in pollinators, which are, you know, not the worst thing to have around fruiting plants. Anecdotally, we have never imported ladybugs onto this property, but we have them everywhere, including our high tunnels in late winter when we need them the most for aphid control. I assume this is true because our dedication to having an abundance of flowers and mulchy habitats for them the ladybugs to bed in. Another thing professional growers do is they investigate life cycles of both pests and pest predators so that they can help in that life cycle, like with predators, or interrupt the life cycle, like with pests. Uh, take the squash bug, for instance. It's good to know that this particular pest likes to overwinter on debris, encouraging you to clean up rocks and woody debris around the areas where you plan to plant squash next year. It's also good to know that they only really go through one cycle per year, starting in the spring. So if you can protect your plants through that early spring cycle, here it's around mid-June, you can avoid a grave infestation for the rest of the year. It's important to be able to recognize the uniform and admittedly kind of cool way that they lay eggs on fruit and leaves. Um, that way you know to remove those eggs when you see them. Being able to recognize the eggs and or the nymphs alerts you to incoming infestations so you can treat them or on a small scale, just smash them. And never just assume something is a pest. This, for instance, is a sack of beneficial parasitic wasp eggs. These are not worm eggs, but parasitic wasp eggs. This is not a pest, but the larva of the ladybug. Know thine enemy, but also, you know, know thine enemy's enemy. My enemy is a soft edible plastic called American cheese. Another way growers manage pests is through crop rotation. I know there is a lot of interest in the idea of not rotating crops, and in some cases it may work, but in a lot of cases it can simply bolster, harbor, encourage, etc., pests and disease populations. And the studies really bear that out. It may work, but it's also risky business to not rotate your crops. If you are having a recurring pest issue, breaking the cycle by both moving those crops and following all of the other above guidance can be an effective part of the strategy. Um, two other important things to touch on are the planting of flowers plus bird and bug habitats to support pest predators. A diversity of flowers brings in all sorts of beneficial bugs from parasitoids, that is a fun word to say, to pollinators, to pest predators, and other uh, alliterative things. 
Birds like wrens and sparrows and martins and so on will devour large populations of insects. Um, encourage anything that can lend your soil an extra hand while keeping your plants safe from overpopulations of certain pests. Most growers I know don't do a lot of trap cropping, but if you're curious about this approach, um, and there is some evidence it works better than I had originally thought, which is basically just planting one crop that attracts pests more than another crop to kind of attract them away from the crop you want to save. Anyway, if you're curious about that, check out the companion planting versus interplanting video I did. That'll be helpful. There's some more info in there. Okay, so let's go through a couple crops and see what pest management looks like. First, though, if you like these sort of nerdy, detailed videos, consider picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook from notillgrowers.com or a hat, or become a Patreon member at patreon.com slash notillgrowers. Anyway, let's do these zucchini since I happen to be planting them this week. First, it's not the worst idea to protect cucurbits in the greenhouse if you intend to transplant them as opposed to direct seed them. Covering the young transplants will help keep cucumber beetles from taking bites out of the leaves even before they hit the field, which is not great. Um, next, we plant the squash into well-prepared soils. Zucchini are medium to heavy feeders, so a nice application of good compost may be in order. Immediately after planting, we cover them with insect netting to protect from cucumber beetles um, or possibly squash bugs or vine borers, etc. Then, once they begin to flower, we will remove the cover. Throughout their life, they need adequate water and sunlight, preferably irrigated from drip to prevent foliar diseases. Um, that will help them to just sort of take off once you take that cover off. And obviously, once you pull the insect netting off, you are at a high risk of having pest issues, but you also gave the crop a wildly beneficial head start. So if the soil is at all healthy, free of compaction and adequately moistened, they should get into the fruiting period without issue. Uh, we monitor for issues like vine borers and squash bugs, eggs and larvae, etc. as we harvest. If the problem blooms out of control, there are some organic controls you can use, such as neem-based sprays. Um, the Arbico Organics website is the best resource for these. It actually has a lot of good resources for just pest management in general, plus actual supplies. If you want to use those things, um, use them sparingly. Just don't let the squash bugs take over because they will grow in numbers really quickly and threaten later or other plantings of cucurbits. It's better to mow them slightly early and lose some yield than propagate a pest like that. We have videos on both summer and winter squash that you can check out for more, you know, production information. Uh, now, crop number two, kale. Well, I say kale, but kale is in the brassica family, and this is basically the same approach we use for any brassica. If we are starting the brassica in the greenhouse, especially in the late summer, with things like Brussels sprouts and cabbages, we will cover it to protect it from flea beetles and or cabbage worms or loopers. Um, also, we always monitor plants pretty closely for aphids. If you see aphids, move them to the other side of the greenhouse to get them away from any ants that may be farming them. That's not a joke that ants really do herd and sometimes milk aphids, which is Really wild to see and kind of awesome. Anyway, shake off or pick off the aphids. If they persist or grow in numbers, you can check out the insecticidal soap or neem options that are out there. Alternatively, if you are not worried about certifications, like organic certification like we are, um, mixing some hot sauce, garlic, and soap together as a spray can do the trick pretty nicely in terms of just getting rid of aphids. You can also just hold the plant and kind of spray it down. Ideally, you are planting the healthiest possible transplant, so take care of it in, in the greenhouse before you get it into the field. Next, like the squash, we make sure the soil is healthy and well-prepared, so broad forked if need be and amended with compost. Also, like squash, we will cover this plant with insect net to protect it primarily from flea beetles. If we are direct seeding a brassica like radishes, we will cover right after seeding. In the late summer, the netting will also help with harlequin beetles. Those are a difficult pest, so pick them off the second that you see them. Now, you can technically keep brassicas covered throughout their life since they are not a fruit. That's a lot of work to manage in terms of weeds and pathway management and harvest having to pull the cover off. But on a small scale, it's totally fine. It's totally doable and it will protect your plants for a long time. Generally speaking, I prefer the coverage to sprays because, well, 
spraying is time consuming, but also a lot of available sprays are broad spectrum, meaning they won't just kill what you want them to kill, but other things as well that you don't wanna kill, bees and all the things. The one big exception to that, and also the only spray application we use on our certified organic farm is Bacillus thuringiensis, or BT. This is simply a bacterium used to control things like the cabbage worm that is permitted in organic agriculture. Just make sure that you get the right BT for the job because there are a few types of BT out there um, and each one has a specific pest it targets. Anyway, if you have specific pest questions, head over to the notillgrowers.com forum because I can't often get to them here on YouTube. Also, for a more refined and linear approach, you can look into Integrated Pest Management or IPM, which lays out roughly the same stuff just more academically and not, you know, with dad jokes. Feel free to add to these approaches in the comment section. Otherwise, like this video if you like this video. If you are not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye.